will be uh, welcome everyone to Bethel Church service, Sunday morning service. This is our 11 a.m. service at Bethel Church, Taylorsville, Kentucky. We want to thank you for tuning in. We, uh, we want to ask you to stay with us and, and send an invite to all of your friends. Uh, if you've got your cell phone, get your cell phone out and log on and just uh, start inviting people to come and watch our service. Amen? Amen. Amen. Am I on? You're on. You got something. Oh. That thing's probably going to do that. <laughs> I'm probably uh, may have to take that program off. Well, I won't be using that. I do want to give a praise report. Uh, we used uh, the laptop Thursday night, and uh, it cut off after uh, I had rebuilt it. Uh, I played it for 24 hours straight, and it didn't have any problem at all. In fact, uh, I, you know, and I played it all kinds of ways. I played it upside down. I played it on its top. I, uh, anyway, uh, it's working. But I'm going to keep testing it before I bring it in and use it for church. Amen. Um, so uh, we do want to thank you for tuning in. We want to thank you for inviting your friends. Uh, we, we want to thank you for... Uh, working through our uh, technical difficulties here at Bethel Church. Uh, we don't have thousands of dollars in TV equipment. We just have a little camera and we have a, a little attachment that puts it into our computer. And um, we just want to share our broadcast with you because God has laid it on our heart to share with Facebook Live. Uh, Facebook doesn't always like our posts. YouTube don't always like our posts. Sometimes they reject <clears throat> me putting my uh, YouTube or my the, the video for our Sunday service. Sometimes they reject it on YouTube. Uh, so, you know, it, it's just a constant struggle to keep everything. We do try to get them on our website. Uh, <clears throat> So if you are watching and you have are inclined to do so, you can go to our Bethel uh, Church Ministries org website and uh, go there and check us out. There's a lot of information on the website. There's information about our men. There's information about our women. There's information about our church. Uh, it tells you on there how we got started. Uh, and this morning, we're going to be talking about the church of Sardis. We'll be in Revelation chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. I'll be reading this morning now the uh, English Standard Version. Um, I, I use different versions at times. I want to let you know before, while everybody's looking it up and getting there, uh, <clears throat> Sardis was a very important church. It, it's it, Sardis was 30 miles southeast of Thyatira. It's one of the noblest and bravest and most storied of all the cities of the East. For over 2,000 years, it was a famous city under successive empires. Sardis was on a hill 1,500 feet above the surrounding landscape. Opposing armies could not figure out how to attack Sardis and how to overcome it. Uh, they did post sentries to watch very closely uh, everything that went on around Sardis. And they did see one day when one of the soldiers dropped his helmet and it rolled down the hill. Uh, when, when he come out to retrieve his helmet, they were watching him, and he showed them the path, how to come out and how to go back and then get back into Sardis. And they, more, uh, they were happy to uh, use that path, and then Sardis was captured and overrun. So um, this morning we're in Revelation chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. 
and to the angel of the church in Sardis write, the words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works. You have a reputation of being alive, Ooh. but you are dead. Wake up, strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. Remember then what you have received and heard. Keep it and repent. If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know what hour I will come against you. Yet you still have a few names in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments, and they walk with me in white, for they are worthy. The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot out his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This is God's word. Let's pray. Lord God, give us teachable spirits this morning. Give us an ear to hear. Father, so many times we hear important messages and we just let them pass on by. We don't take note of it. We get used to the racket of life, the the buzz, the constant noise. We get used to the television playing or the radio being on. And we tune it out. Lord God, we've been guilty of tuning you out. We've got so much noise going on in our life. The TV, the radio, all the different forms of entertainment, our cell phones. All of it keeps us so busy we don't have time to focus at all on you. We don't take the time to focus on you. And we surely are not keeping our ears tuned to hear what you have to say to us. Lord God, give us pause this morning. Help us to put everything on pause. Help us to stop for a minute. Help us to lay down everything that we are doing. Help us to stop cooking. Help us to stop do whatever it is we're doing today and take time to listen to you. Help us, Father, to take the time and purposely tune our ears to what you have to say. Lord God, help us to lay aside everything else but you. And we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. A church with a reputation for being alive but was dead. We have to stop and ask ourselves this morning, what is our reputation? Do we have a reputation for even being alive? For those watching by Facebook and, and all your friends on Facebook who watch all of your posts on Facebook, what is your reputation on Facebook? What is your reputation upon, among your family? This is a hard one. Our families, we probably have the worst reputation of all in our families. Our families are harder on us than anybody else because they remembered everybody that we kicked on the shin <laughs> when we were kids. They remembered all the crazy stuff we did growing up. They remember all the times that we didn't live according to the Word of God. They remember all of that. And our community remembers that. What is our reputation in a community? 
Are we like the prodigal son? Has our reputation changed since uh, we... Uh, David, you might want to check the video. What's going on with the video? We we got a we got a black screen going on with the video. You don't. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Well, anyway, um, distractions. Everything distracts us from where we need to be. We get distracted. You get distracted. And as we were saying, what is our reputation with those in our community? Have we been like the prodigal son? Have we changed the way we are since we come to know Jesus Christ? Did it make a difference when we met Christ face to face? And I think many of us can say that, yes, it did. And I think some of us can say, oh, uh, I need help in this area. The Holy Spirit is co-equal and co-eternal with the Father. And we want to look at that. Jesus comes in the, the seven spirits of God. And he's, he is recognizing the Holy Spirit as he comes to the church of Sardis. Jesus always has a way to come to each church in a form that helps them to see what he needs for them to see and to hear. Jesus has a way to come to us and to help us to see and to, and to do the things that we need to get accomplished. So he comes and he, he brings a very strong anointing of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit cannot be properly spoken of as a possession of Jesus Christ we really must recognize that the Holy Spirit is co-equal with God the Father and with Jesus Christ. That is what we call the Trinity. That is one of the foundational principles of the, the, our faith, is the Trinity. That's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We cannot have the Father without the Son and the Holy Spirit. Jesus Christ is considered and is the Son of God. He is not an angel of God. There are other groups who want to say that Jesus Christ is only an angel. Some of them say that they got different names for him other than Jesus Christ. But Jesus Christ is literally the Son of God, and he is co-equal with God, and the Holy Spirit is co-equal with God the Father and God the Son. Who do you say that Jesus is? He cannot be placed in the same footing as the seven stars. The seven stars are the seven angels of the seven assemblies. The message to Sardis is a warning to all churches and people that are living on past glory. How many churches have you seen that in the past they were what we call blowing and going. They were, they were there. They were working and they were reaching people for Jesus Christ. And we know that churches, we, how many of you remember being in one of those churches and you were a part of that church? And when you went to church, you knew that God was there when you were there and you felt the Holy Spirit of God. And you were you were a part of something that you were proud of. You could see that the chairs and the benches and the whatever people sat on were filling up. People would come and they would be excited. They would before service they were talking and they were chit chatting with each other and they were hugging on each other and just glad to see each other. But something happened. Somewhere, somewhere, people began to chit chat over the telephone and in small groups. And pretty soon, some of the people were hurt and wounded and they began to leave. 
And pretty soon the church that was once doing a work for Jesus Christ, their work is a thing of the past. This message to Sardis is a warning to all churches and all assemblies that are caught in living in the past. Well, you may I can remember, man, when I was in Temple Baptist Church in uh, Redford, Michigan, I can remember bringing over a thousand kids in on Sunday morning to the church. But that was yesterday, and yesterday's gone. What did we do yesterday? Who did you contact yesterday? Who did you go see yesterday? Who did you try to have a witness to yesterday? I'm talking about yesterday, Saturday, this, the last day of last week. Who did we make an effort to witness to yesterday? Spiritual ministries often go through four stages. Those stages are, they start with, a, it starts with a man. It becomes a movement. And after it's a movement, it becomes a machine. And then after a machine, it becomes a monument. Temple Baptist Church that I was a part of in Redford, Michigan, it was a great church, had a great testimony, had a great past. They started out at 14th and Marquette in downtown Detroit. They, their minister was pastoring two churches. He was pastoring one church in Texas and this church in Detroit. And he spent most of his time traveling on the train back and forth. He'd preach in one church on Sunday and, and he'd preach on the, in the next church the next Sunday. Temple Baptist Church grew and it prospered. And as the, the auto industry came into Detroit and got stronger and stronger, Bethel, or, uh, Temple Baptist Church got stronger and stronger. And they moved out further out of Detroit. They moved to uh, Grand River Avenue. And on Grand River Avenue, they built a building that would seat 5,000 people. And they filled it. And there was barely room to park. I think they had five or six acres on Grand River Avenue. Huge building. And they expanded, and they, but then they reached their pinnacle, and they began to decline. And then they built another building in Redford, Michigan. And that's the building I attended at. That's where I worked. There was 25 acres there. The, the building would hold about 3,500 people. It was often on Sunday, we had over 2,000 people at Temple Baptist Church. My sister even came up, my, and my dad, they were there. And uh, Temple Baptist Church had a, a failure in the leadership, and it created a real problem. And in the midst of the decline, the, the failure in leadership didn't help a thing. And Temple Baptist Church after I moved back to Kentucky, Temple Baptist Church had, had already bought property uh, a further way on out. Temple Baptist Church is still alive. It's still going. They had a resurgence. They renamed themselves. They, re they kind of reinvented what they were and what they were about. And now they're on the upswing of churches they did not let the, the problems overcome them. They have become a, a, a more uh, a, a church that speaks into the lives of people today rather than staying with everything that we did 100 years ago. Now, we've played songs this morning from 
a hundred years ago. Praise God. And those songs should speak to us. You know, I, I'm very leery of the modern music that we have. There's so much of it that has become a performance. Sardis was at the monument stage, but there was still hope. Sometimes we get that way in our personal lives. What stage are you at in your personal life? Are you growing in Jesus Christ? Or has it become, have you built a monument to yourself? The impression is that the assembly in Sardis was not aggressive in its witness to the city. There was no persecution because there was no invasion of the enemy's territory. No f friction usually means no motion. The unsaved in Sardis saw the church as a respectable group of people who were neither dangerous nor desirable. They were decent people with a dying witness and a decaying ministry. Sounds like much of the church today. Does that describe Bethel Church today? Do we create enough friction in our community that people have an opinion about us? We need to wake up. Jesus said, wake up. Luke 21, 34 says, be on guard so that your hearts will not be weighed down with dissipation. And that is self-indulgence. and drunkenness and worries of life, and that day will not come to you suddenly like a trap. That refers me to Luke 17, 26 and 27. Just as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the son, days of the Son of Man. People went on eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage until the day that Noah boarded the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. That's what's going on in the world today. People are going on with business as usual. They have been consumed with dissipation or self-indulgence. People are consumed with getting all I can and canning all I get. I want to get, 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 get. There's never enough. We are all, look, we are all so much in this world that we find ourselves caught in this trap. One of our relatives told my dad one time, he said, Frank, I just buy everything I want. But I make it a practice to not want very much. <laughs> Homer Cook. Homer Cook. Just... Lived on your road. Hmm. For I will come on, Luke 21, 35 says, For I will come on all those who dwell on the face of the earth, but keep on the alert at all times, praying that you may have strength to escape all these things that are about to take place and to stand before the Son of Man. These things are about to take place that Jesus was talking about. In the, in the book of Revelation, these things were about to take place because the church of Sardis represents the Reformation period the, from the 1400s until about 1800, a time it was a terrible time in the church. Remember what we received. We need to remember the things that we have received from the Lord. We have to have a teachable spirit in all of this. We have to be awake when we read our Bible. How many of you read your Bible and you, you read about two chapters and you don't even have a clue what you just read? <laughs> Now, I know that happens when you read your favorite book other than the Bible. You got this book, and you, you come in, you sit down, you plop in your big stuffed 
overstuffed chair, you know, that leather recliner that you've got. And when that leather recliner begins to warm up, you begin to drift off to sleep, right? It's what I do. Look, we often read and we don't know what we read. We often go to sleep in prayer. I've done it here on Thursday night. Is that right? Can I get a witness for that? <laughs> you know, we can do that. We do do that. We have to be awake in church. <laughs> That, that that's a problem. Some people have a problem with that. I've had a problem with that. When I was farming, I'd come in. When I was driving a truck, I'd come in. I'd sometimes I'd go to church. Look, there was there was a time that I was in California on Thursday afternoon and and I made it back to be in church in Florence, Kentucky on Sunday morning. And uh, I spent some time driving. I won't tell you how I did it. <laughs> and I didn't have an automatic pilot. My, church, my truck didn't drive itself. I didn't have a partner. I didn't have a co-driver. Co we have to be awake in church. Most important, we have to be, have, be open to hear God and receive what God is saying to us. We can tune God out really, really easy. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that we all can recall a time in our past when we were about to make a life-changing decision and God was trying to get our attention and we just kept saying, Later. Come, come back. Remind me later. Just like was on the computer screen a minute ago. They, my, my cell phone has been trying to update itself all morning. and I, There's no option to not update your cell phones anymore. They shove it on you whether you want it or not. And I've told it twice already. Remind me later. We do that with God. Remind me later, God. Today's not the good day for this. I mean, I've, I've got important stuff to do. We do that. We treat God that way. We have to remember. We have to have a teachable spirit. We have to be awake. We, we have to remember that we receive salvation by faith. That song this morning, old song, old, old song. How did they receive their salvation in that song? By faith. Today's world, we've got all the add-ons for different kinds of things that we have to do to jump through the hoop of salvation. It's no longer by faith alone. It's no longer by just believing in Jesus Christ in this world. Now we have to have lordship salvation. Now you have to have uh, baptism. Now you have to repent. We, you know, you have to make Jesus the Lord of your life or you can't be saved. Let me ask you something. How does a person who is lost have the ability to come and to make Jesus Christ the Lord of their life before they get saved? That's just plumb ridiculous. And then we have to worry. There's some groups that say we have to worry about whether we're a part of the elect or not. And then there are some groups who has this kind of work you got to do. And if, if you don't, you know, if you do all of these things, you mess up. And uh, there's all kinds of things in today's world other than receiving Jesus Christ by faith. John 14, 6, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father but by me. 
For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. It's by faith. We have to remember we receive salvation by faith. And we have to remember that we got the Word of God by revelation. It's the revelation. God spoke to holy men of old as He moved them. They wrote. They weren't like a dictation machine. They were writing and their personalities came into everything they wrote. And those original manuscripts are what we consider to be <coughs> unrefutable. They are the Word of God. <coughs> they were perfect. Deuteronomy 6, 5 says to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Do not move the ancient landmarks that your fathers have set up. 1 Thessalonians 5.15 says, See that no one repays anyone evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. 1 Thessalonians 5.16, Rejoice always. These are the things that we're supposed to be remembering. These are the things that the church of Sardis had forgotten. We need to remember to remember. Don't repay evil. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Don was talking about this morning, uh, about um, Mrs. Marsh had posted a song on her Facebook, It Is Well With My Soul. Amen. And Don was recounting part of the, the the reason that guy wrote that song. He had lost his son. But not only that, he had lost his daughters as his family traveled to Europe. And after he had lost all of these members of his family, he was able to write a song that says, It is well with my soul. Uh, yes, we are. A lot of us love that song, and a lot of us would like to say that it is well with our soul. And we sing it and joyfully sing it. And sometimes there are many people who sing that song, but then they complain about every circumstance that comes down the pike uh, that happens in their life. Well, I do it. We're guilty of it. We have to remember we are to rejoice always and to pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, and do not quench the Spirit of God. That's 1 Thessalonians 5.19. 1 Thessalonians 5.20. Do not despise prophecies. There are prophecies. There are preachers. There are both. But we've got a lot today that are not prophets that are saying that they're prophets. 1 Thessalonians 5.21, test everything. Hold fast what is good. We are not supposed to be duped into everything, and people and churches are being duped. The church of Sardis was being duped. They just were dead in the water. And a lot of churches are dead in the water today. They have a name that they live. They got a big, nice church. They got air conditioning. They got organs. They got pianos. They got a, a band or an orchestra. They, I think in church it's called an orchestra, isn't it? <laughs> we have a name that we're alive, but we're dead. Many of us, many churches... First Thessalonians 5.22, abstain from every form of evil. We've got churches that have yoga. 
And we got churches that have a, a lot assortment of other things that are just as bad. We can't point a finger at, at if they just have yoga, but it's not just yoga. There's other things. I, one of my biggest gripes is Easter. Used to be my favorite holiday. The thing that I look forward to, being in church on Easter Sunday. And then I figured out and I read what Easter really is all about. Easter started with the worship of Ishtar. They had colored Easter eggs. They had a bunny. I used to make fun of it. They had a, a commercials on TV of a, a rabbit laying eggs. But this is the whole thing is terrible because the Easter eggs that they had when they worship Ishtar was colored red from the blood of the children they sacrificed. Well, how many children have we sacrificed in America? To convenience, we're at least 60 million, right? Mm -hmm. That's why I put more of a Passover as more of an emphasis than Easter. Easter, so yes, we remember that Jesus Christ rose on Easter Sunday morning. That is the focus of what we have here on Sunday morning. It's not the Easter egg hunt. And I know that all the mamas that's got little children, that they love to get them a basket and throw the eggs out in the grass and have the kids to find it. Uh, it's fun for you while you're indoctrinating your kids that Easter is about Easter egg hunting. I know I get a lot of people don't like it when I say that. They don't like for me to tell the truth. Amen. But Easter is not about Jesus Christ to a lot of the world. Jesus Christ should be the focus of everything we do. That's right. <clears throat> First, uh, John thirteen thirty four, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. We have twisted love in this country. In America, we think love means that we accept you no matter what you do and that we accept what you do. That is not what true love is. True love confronts evil. True love confronts our, the people we love when they act stupid. When they're stupid is acting stupid. We confront that. True love confronts because we love them. If you got somebody that's just doing something that's they're stealing, they're they're on drugs, they're drinking, they're committing acts that are terrible, if we really love them, we will really confront them. Amen. But our society today says that if you confront somebody, you don't love them. By this shall all people know that you are my disciples, that you have love for one another. When we're truly a disciple of Jesus Christ and we see our brother doing something that we know beyond a shadow of a doubt doesn't line up with the Word of God, it's up to us to confront them, to speak love. It doesn't matter if they're not our brother. If they're our children and they go off stupid, we're supposed to confront them. Amen. If they're our friends, we're supposed to say what God says to say. Iron sharpens iron. Remember what you heard, the doctrine of grace. Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. For by grace have you been saved through faith. It's not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. Not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. We all got saved by grace. 
If we're saved, we're saved by grace. God gave us grace. Grace, the acronym for grace is God's riches at Christ's expense. We get God's riches because of what Jesus Christ did when he died on the cross. When he was beaten cruelly by the Romans. When he was had his flesh torn from his body. How he suffered and he bled and he was striped and whipped over and over. And then he had to carry his own cross to the uh, the hill far away. And then he laid down on top of that cross as the Roman soldiers drove the spikes through his arms and his feet. Now, let me point out that they did not drive the spikes through his hands. And <coughs> the reason that they couldn't have drove the spikes through his hands is they would have ripped the, the the flesh would have just ripped out. They drove the spike in between this bone. These bones would not separate in the the wrist. We were saved by faith by what Jesus Christ did for us. When we recognized that he was the perfect sacrifice, the perfect lamb of God, when we realize that he is the son of God, and when we say that we now believe that and we want him to be in our life and we accept what he did because we deserve a sinner's hell, because we have lied, because we have committed adultery, because we have committed homosexuality, because we have done this and we have done that. We have lied on our neighbors. We haven't loved our neighbors. We've hated our parents. Children today are unthankful. They are unholy. They treat the parents sometimes awful, yeah. just like in Jesus' day. The Children sometimes would say, well, parents, I can't take care of you anymore. I've dedicated all that I would do for you to the church. And the Jews of the day said, that's good. And Jesus called them out for it. We have children today that are unholy. They want to do everything. Listen, I know of kids who just go completely berserk if the parents take their cell phone away from a 10 and 11 and 12 year old kid. Children today beat their parents. I'm talking about 12, 13, 14, 15 year old boys and girls beating their parents, beating them till they got black eyes and bruised faces and fat lips. Children today are not like the children were when I grew up. Man, well, I didn't dare touch my dad. I wouldn't even think about touching my dad. Never occurred to me. It just never occurred. Look, we got to remember that we are we are saved by grace, and all of that stuff that we have done, Jesus died for that. Jesus died on the cross for the Muslims who have cut somebody's head off for being a Christian. We watched the movie Thursday night, Tortured for Christ. Jesus died for the ones who was torturing those Christians. Jesus died for the rapists who rape men and women and boys and girls. Jesus died for the rapists. Jesus died for the ones who are kidnappers, the ones who steal young boys and young girls as sex slaves. Jesus died for them. <clears throat> we have to remember the doctrine of love. We have to remember the doctrine of sacrificial living for Jesus Christ. We are called as Christians to
to live sacrificially for Jesus Christ. Instead of feeding all of our wants and our desires, we have to be willing to give up something. And Jesus calls on Christians to be willing to give up something for Jesus. Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me. Jesus said, keep it. Hold fast to the above doctrines, though the majority is against them. Learned men despise them. They are changed with enthusiasm and licentiousness. They are charged with enthusiasm and licentiousness. It looks as if there was danger, as and there is, as there is, and that they would be entirely wrestled out of Sardis's hands. Were to repent. We are to repent from the things that we have been doing. Romans 12, 9. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Romans 12, 10. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Romans 12, 11, do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Romans 12, 12, rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Romans 12, 13, contribute to the need of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Romans 12, 14, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Boy, that's a tough one. I mean, those that persecute us, those that talk bad about us, those who want to slice us to ribbons. It's 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 in my old man to return kind for kind. And if I'm not careful, the old man will do that. Romans. 12.15, rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Romans 12.16, live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Now this haughtiness thing, we see a lot of haughty people today. I mean, they throw their head up and they kind of got a smirk on their face. Haughtiness is rampant. It's rampant in the youth. (laughs) My sister's demonstrating it. (laughs) Amen. We have to be careful. Haughtiness. This is right out of the book of Romans. I'm reading right out of the book of Romans. Romans 12, uh, 17. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to what is honorable in the sight of all. In our society, man, we just want to, you know, we want to return evil for evil. Mm-hmm. If we're not careful, returning evil for evil will get us in trouble. Yeah. But then there are certain groups that returning evil for good gets rewarded. Romans 12, 18, if possible, so far as it depends on you and me, live peaceably with everybody. If it depends on me, I'm supposed to live peaceably with every one of you all and all of my neighbors, if it's at all possible. Now look, there's sometimes living at peace becomes an impossibility. If your neighbors want to steal all of your cattle and they keep coming over at night and getting one out here and one out there, you know what? Pretty soon you're not going to have any cattle left and you're going to go broke and you're going to be selling your farm because you can't pay the taxes on it. If it possible, live at peace with all men. But when your neighbor wants to steal all that you have, sometimes you have to take up and not live in peace with them. You have to show them it's like two countries. 
there comes a time when we can't be peaceable with other people when they will not be peaceable with us. Kids find that out in school. And a lot of times in school, there's been somebody that's a bully that bullies people, and then somebody has enough, and they just clean his clock for him. And they're the ones that get in trouble. If it's all possible, live in peace with all men. And if you can't, be careful how you take care of the situation. Obey the laws of the land. Romans 12, 19. Beloved, never avenge yourselves. Oh, my goodness. But leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. So that takes care of it when we want to take matters into our own hand. Mm -hmm. Romans 12, 20. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Romans 12, 21. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. God's word is hard on us sometimes, isn't it? Our, our nature wants to take care of this thing on our own, man. Get my gun. I'm going to go pay you a visit. Wake up, or Jesus will come like a thief. We need to wake up. David brought out something earlier today. I'm going to bring it up again. Hebrews 12, 5. And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be wary when reproved by him. Spent a lot of time putting together a chart. And if any of you watching by Facebook would like one, write us a text, send us a message. We'll get you one. This whole chart, the point of the chart is to show us that God doesn't take lightly our disobedience. And that's what he's saying to the church of Sardis. I'm not taking lightly the fact that you're just going on merrily on your way and you have a name of being alive, but you're really dead. Now, what he's saying to them is you're really not saved. You act like a Christian. You walk like a Christian. You talk like a Christian. You've got all the Christian lingo, but you're not saved. And if you are saved and you're acting that way, here's what I'm going to do. The Lord disciplines the ones he loves and chastises every son, son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. What son is there for whom his father does not discipline him? Hebrews 12, 18. If you are left without discipline, in which of you have all participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. In other words, if God has not disciplined us, we're illegitimate. We're not a child of God. Hey, guys, 2.17 says, I smote you in every work of your hands with blasting, wind, with mildew, hail, yet you did not come back to me, declares the Lord. Christians cannot get away with living the, any old way they want to. If you're not a Christian, you can get away with it until you die. And when you die, it is bad news. There will never be any good news. I would want to be a Christian. If I'm not a Christian and I heard somebody say that, I'd be wanting to find out how to become a Christian really quick. Amen. Today's the day of salvation. Don't put it off. 
James chapter 1, verse 13, for those of us who say we're Christians, let no one say when he is tempted, I'm being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. God does not tempt us to do evil. God does not put temptation in front of us when we do evil. It's not God that put the temptation there. It's not God that made us that way. But each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. James chapter 1 verse 15, when lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. That's not talking about losing your soul. That's talking about losing your life. That's talking about God saying, look, I've, he, he's never going to, he's going to keep being a bad testimony. He's going to slander my name everywhere he goes. I want him in heaven. I'm just going to bring him on. I'm going to do it now. Heart attack time. Stroke time. Auto wreck time. Whatever. However God needs to accomplish it, He will allow it to happen. And He will bring people home. Christians who were once good Christians. God will not blot out their name out of in the book of Revelation chapter 3 and verse 4, but you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. Okay, this is the ones in Sardis who have their name in the Lamb's book of life, and they're walking with him, and they're going to walk with Jesus in white. And he who overcomes, though, right here, he, when he says, he who overcomes, he's talking about people who get saved, who will get saved. They overcome evil. They overcome everything, every obstacle that the world throws at them in order to get saved. The world don't want you saved. Satan don't want you saved. The people around you oftentimes hate it if you get saved. Because you're not any fun anymore. Look, those who get saved, those who overcome, will be clothed in white garments. They don't already have white garments. Those of us who are born again already have our white garments. We can't see them, but we have them. But the ones who are going to get saved, the ones who are in the church of Sardis, the ones who are in the world today who do get saved, they will overcome and they will get their white garments. And they will, and Jesus said, I will not erase his name from the book of life. And I will confess his name before my father, before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the spirit has to say to the churches. We need to listen because there's things in our life, every one of us, we're all what, we, none of us can say I'm without sin. We all need to take note. What is God saying? Look, there is no fear of God in this world. We see that. People have no fear of God. They walk, they do the most terrible things. And it's worse and worse and worse because people hadn't, don't have a fear of God. God has put up with our sin. God has put up with the sin of all the church of Sardis there is in the United States and in the world today. Because the church of Sardis represents a church that Jesus talked about. It represents a period in the church history from about 1400 or something like that to about 1800. Then there was the Reformation. Then there was a, this represents churches today. There are churches today who are the church of Sardis. We have churches today that, that we have driven by. They have beautiful brick buildings. They have beautiful stone buildings. They have beautiful buildings, periods. They have their lawns are immaculate. They're groomed to the T. 
They have the perfect lights inside of their church. They have the perfect sound system. They have the perfect choir. They have the, everything is perfect. And they're the church of Sardis. They have a reputation that they're alive and they're really dead. And then the church of Sardis represents individuals. There are periods of time in our lives that we act like we're alive, but we're living like atheists. We live like practical atheists. We say that we're Christians and we act like an atheist. Our decisions are made because that's what we want to do. Our, we make choices. We make friends with people we ought not be friends with. We hang out with the wrong crowd. We're doing the wrong things. Many of you are working in the wrong occupation. It's all of this thing combined. We as individuals can be living like the church of Sardis. Luke 10, 20 says, Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this that the spirits are subject to do to you, but rejoice that your names are recorded in heaven. If you have trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ and you have made him as your Savior, you have believed on him for what he did to save you from your sin. Your name is recorded in heaven. If you haven't trusted in Jesus Christ, if you say, well, I don't even know if there is a Jesus Christ. If you say, even if you say, well, I don't even believe there is a Jesus Christ. I don't believe there was ever a Jesus Christ. I don't believe in God. There couldn't be a God. The scientists tell us there's no God. The scientists tell us that we all come from monkeys. And the monkeys come from some kind of something that's slime that come up out of the ocean. But where did the ocean come from? Oh, it was the Big Bang. Well, where did the Big Bang come from? Well, I don't know. Something had to cause it. What? The atheists, the ones who want to be evolutionists, the ones who are in government, the government wants us to worship them. They want to be God for us. They want us to call them God. That's what the Romans did in their day. They wanted everybody in their uh, kingdom to say that they were gods. There is a God. There is a creator God that created this world. He created Adam and Eve. He created all of the animals. He created every plant and every tree. God is the creator. His son, Jesus Christ, is the savior. In fact, God, God thought it, Jesus spoke it, and the Holy Spirit keeps this world in going. All three of them. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, first Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God, God is Elohim. God, Elohim is the Trinity. In the very first verse of the Bible, the Trinity is there. If you're not saved, your name is not in the Lamb's book of life. If you're saved, your name is in the Lamb's book of life, and it will not come out of the Lamb's book of life. Therefore, everyone who confesses me before men, I will also confess him before my Father who is in heaven. If we have trusted in Jesus Christ, and it becomes evident in our life, and we tell other people that we have trusted in Jesus Christ, that means that Jesus is going to confess us. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who has an ear, let, let him hear what the Spirit's saying to me today. Every one of us is a me. You're a me, I'm a me. For those of us who have, hey, good buddy, do you have your ears on? When we back, we're on the CB radio. Then we quite had to quit calling people good buddy. It had to be, hey, buddy, do you have your ears on? 
this morning? Do we have our ears on? Are we hearing what God is saying to us? God is saying to us, some of you are saved and some of you are not saved. And those of you who are not saved, I'm giving you a chance. Today is a day that you can believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to be saved. It's not God's will that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. For whosoever will shall call upon the name of the Lord. For whosoever will. That's a big that's a big concept in the Bible. And there's many that said, well, if you're not a part of the elect, you can't be for whosoever will. That's two different groups of people. The elect... They're going to get saved no matter what happens. That's what the, that, that group says. Then the other group says, for whosoever will. I'm part of the for whosoever will group. Because I believe that for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. But I'm going to tell you something. I've had people pray the sinner's prayer with me, and I asked them if they were saved after they got through praying the sinner's prayer. And they said, no, I'm not any more saved than a Christmas turkey. <laughs> and that blew me away I just couldn't see how anybody could pray to God that, to save them and then still not get saved but it's possible I believed him I believed he was still lost I believed he did not mean it I believe he was just mouthing words God wants you saved if you're watching this and you're not saved. If you're here and you're watching, and you're, you're hearing this, and God wants you saved. It's not God's will that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. It's not God's will for anybody to go to hell. But if you reject Him, He has no choice but to let you have your way. God will let you have your way. That's called free will. If you choose to walk away from Jesus Christ and not accept Him, God will let you have your way. He who has an ear, let him hear. Those of us who are saved and God is speaking to us, God spoke to me through all of this. For whosoever will, let, let him hear what the Spirit has to say. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for how it affects us. Thank you for how your Holy Spirit teaches us and talks to us. Thank you for the conviction that comes in our heart. <clears throat> thank you for the conviction that pricks our soul, that gets our attention, that makes us think, oh, I need to change something there. Lord God, help us work in our lives. Keep us close to you. Keep us, Lord, close to your will. Keep us doing what you want us to do. Keep us, Lord, telling others about Jesus. <clears throat> Keep us speaking to other people and telling other people what Jesus did for us. Help us, Lord God, to share our testimony. Help us, Lord God, to love other people even when they're not lovable. Oh, Lord God, help us to love our enemies. Help us to pray for our enemies. Help us to do good to our enemies. Oh, Lord God, we need you. Work in our lives. In Jesus' name. Amen.